Okay, I think we'll try to get started on our lecture this evening. My name is Jim Dubert, and I'm with the Iowa State Lectures Committee, and we're sponsoring this event tonight. I'd like to first introduce a representative from uh, the Iowa Normal, which is the, nas which is the uh, National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, and his name is Mr. Judd Golden. He's the state coordinator, and he'll introduce the speaker. Hello. Uh, thank you, Jim. <laughs> I'm glad all you people could be here tonight. It was on very short notice that I knew Bob Randall was coming into Iowa. Uh, I had heard about Bob about a month ago or a month and a half ago when I was at Normal's National Convention in Washington, and I was familiar with his case and his problems before that time. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Bob later. I'd first like to tell you a little bit about Normal and what we're doing here in Iowa. As uh, Jim said, we're the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. We, uh, I'm the state coordinator. I'm an attorney in Des Moines. I just do it on a volunteer basis. And uh, there were a number of people up here in Ames last year who helped me do that volunteer work. And what we were trying to do and what we did last year is got a bill introduced trying to remove the criminal penalties for the simple possession, use, and cultivation of small amounts of marijuana. Uh, our proposal didn't have anything to do with the sale or possession with intent to deliver, unfortunately. We didn't get through the bill last year. <laughs> People have to realize that I feel as strongly as anyone else that what I'd like to see is someday that marijuana be legalized and that we have a full marketplace, just as we do with alcohol and tobacco. But we have to be realistic, and that's what I think Normal is strongest point is, is that we try and be realistic in dealing with the issue in a way that we think we can get some reasonable legislative response from. And we've been successful in eight states, and I think there's a real good chance we can do it in Iowa. But we need people to let their legislators and to let the people around them know what we're trying to do. And we just don't want people to go to jail for simple possession and use of marijuana. We don't want them to be arrested. We don't want them to have criminal records. And it's happening now. 2,500 people in Iowa were arrested last year for simple marijuana possession, and 416,000 nationwide. And we just want that to stop. And it's a serious matter, particularly for people who are the victims of marijuana prohibition. And people you know who are arrested are, and Bob Randall is one of the most glaring examples. Bob is uh, a part, has taught college in uh, Washington, D.C. He found out uh, that he had glaucoma sometime while he was in college, and he found marijuana helped relieve the interocular pressure, that pressure which builds and progressively makes you go blind. Bob will tell you exactly what, is, what, what it feels like, and he'll also tell you what the marijuana did. He'll tell you what, he'll tell you what <coughs> bureaucratic problems he had in trying to convince people that he needed marijuana to save his eyesight, to stop from going blind. It's an amazing example of bureaucratic bungling. He was arrested. They did put him in jail for trying to save his eyesight. And he won. He won his case based on the doctrine of medical necessity, which hadn't been used in years and hadn't been accepted by anyone. And Bob Randall has an incredible story to tell, and I think you'll enjoy it. I also would uh, urge any of you who would like to learn more about Iowa Normal and what you can do to help change the laws here uh, to get in touch with me later or any time. I'll leave some uh, literature here so you can pick it up. And we just work on a volunteer basis. We just try and get people to help. And any of you who want to try and help me do it, I, I, I'd welcome it. Uh, I'll, now I'll let you hear Bob Randall. Can you all see? Can you all see if I do that? No. Uh, hi there. Uh, 
<laughs> terrible. The, I guess the subject is supposed to be marijuana and health, and so I'll go through that as quickly as I can. Uh, <laughs> touch on the case briefly, and uh, then open it up for questions, because I find out that the questions people have are often <coughs> uh, lead interesting places. Um, the medical use of marijuana began about 4,000 years ago in China. Uh, it's one of the basic tenets of Chinese medicine for a while. Uh, in almost every culture that marijuana has been used in, it has been found to have me medical values. The, uh, its introduction into this country came through England, uh, the English association with the Indian people. Uh, caused marijuana to start being used in England for a number of medical reasons, usually related to uh, uh, respiratory problems, uh, pain relief, things like that. In America, it was made available. Uh, in 1860, the state of Ohio did a, uh, an analysis of it, found it to be useful in the treatment of 85 diseases. Uh, it was on the pharmacopedia in, uh, <laughs> in the 1920s. It was advertised as a, an agent for the relief of eye strain, which is what glaucoma would appear to be. Uh, and that's what mine was diagnosed as by a rather inastute optometrist. Uh, suddenly, in 1937, a law was passed. The law was passed using medical grounds as the rationale. Uh, there was no medical evidence to support the action. The action said that marijuana was dangerous. Uh, there was no medical evidence to that effect. Uh, indeed, there were a 1,000 articles that had been written since 1900 that indicated that marijuana had a number of valid applications. Uh, a number of doctors spoke against the bill, saying, if you're going to prohibit this substance, at least make it available for research. They decided to prohibit it outright for any reason, including research, uh, thereby effectively destroying all the medical knowledge that was available. Uh, if you don't teach people about a drug, uh, they quickly turn to whatever the current philosophy is about that drug. In other words, you don't give a doctor training in it, uh, he certainly isn't going to recommend its use. Uh, and as you politicalize a drug, uh, it gets less and less advantageous for someone who spent 8 to 12 to 14 years getting an education to risk his career on what is primarily a, quote, social, unquote, issue. So when the law was passed, it passed for supposed medical reasons because the drug was dangerous. It led to sexual insanity <laughs> and uh, <laughs> any number of other things. Uh, it was passed really for a very specific political purpose and a very specific economic purpose. Uh, the economic purpose was served in the fact that uh, it was during the Depression. American labor needed jobs. Uh, in the Southwest, uh, great numbers of Mexicans were crossing the border to act as migrant laborers. It was a lot easier to prove that they had marijuana than it was to prove that they were illegal aliens. Uh, and in, uh, in the South, blacks had some use of marijuana within their culture. And they also began to do terrible things like invent jazz, which was seen with great fear in a country that had just become to some extent, electronic. They had the radio. And uh, the best thing to do to stop jazz, of course, was to quit them from smoking marijuana, which was the reason that apparently they'd created jazz. Uh, no, no. The political attribute keeps being very profitable. Uh, in the 1950s, you have a group called beatniks who suddenly begin to indulge in marijuana. Uh, they happened not to hold the same political beliefs, perhaps, as a Joseph McCarthy, and marijuana proved a very effective way of maintaining harassment. In the 60s, of course, you have a group of people who are white, young, in college, suddenly protesting what is a national policy, the war in Vietnam. And you suddenly find that marijuana arrests escalate until the number of marijuana arrests can equal the number of people uh, who we send to Vietnam. Uh, and that happened within a period of two years. The arrest figures go from 18,000 to 400,000. Unfortunately, we've left Vietnam, but we're still arresting people for marijuana. It's a very practical, political way of controlling specific uh, portions of the culture. 
Um, the fact that it was profitable in the 60s was sheer accident. Uh, the fact that it was profitable earlier uh, was designed. So what you have in 1970 is the Controlled Substances Act being passed instead of the outright tax law, since the, the Supreme Court ruled you couldn't arrest someone for using marijuana and then also arrest them for not paying the tax. Uh, in constructing the new law, they set up a drug schedule. The drug schedule allowed for five different varieties of drugs. Uh, marijuana was placed on the first category. To meet the qualifications for the first category, the drug has to be subject to abuse, as is almost anything. Uh, it has to be dangerous, and it has to have no recognized, a very interesting word, no recognized medical value. The obvious place where you get that recognition is not from a doctor or from human biology, but from Congress and the bureaucracies. <laughs> the bureaucracy which is in control of marijuana is, or, or in control of the schedule, is the Drug Enforcement Administration that currently is making $120 million a year. Uh, and a substantial portion of that comes from arresting people for smoking marijuana. They are particularly attracted to the small possessor since uh, the larger the possessor, the greater the possibility the man might have a gun. <laughs> but there's, there's, obviously, there's obviously no massive interest on the part of the Drug Enforcement Administration for shifting the marijuana schedule because it would mean a deduction in the number of DEA agents who would be necessary. And in terms of budgetary consideration, it wouldn't be wise. So I think we begin to look at those things and see what happened. Uh, what happened was for 40 years you had no medical research, well for 30 years you had no medical research. In 1968 and 69 when so many people began smoking, the government decided that it would split down the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs into a hydra-headed monster. Uh, the part of that monster would be the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. And the National Institutes on Drug Abuse would be allowed to pursue research on drugs of abuse as was mandated. That didn't include therapeutic application because therapeutic application is not of using a drug, which is a convenient definition which becomes a problem later on. By 1970, you have people beginning to complain about the lack of availability of marijuana for research, even though there is a whole agency to handle that research. Uh, the problem is that if you decide that you want to get marijuana and you're a doctor, you can't go to your local pusher, which everybody else around you is doing, since you're usually <laughs> in a college environment. Uh, it, it must be a very disturbing experience for a researcher to watch Charlie run out and buy his pound of marijuana while you're dealing, first of all, with the school that you're enclosed in, in and getting them to agree that you can do this dangerous drug research on marijuana. Then you have to go to the state agency which controls the school system. And when they approve, then you can go to the state agency which controls the drug. And if all of those people can agree, and they all must agree, which is a complexity because you start <coughs> dealing with larger and larger numbers of people, you can go to the federal government, and you can go to NIDA. And if NIDA approves it, then you can go to FDA. And if FDA approves it, then you can go to the Drug Enforcement Administration. For some reason, the Drug Enforcement Administration, though it has no scientific qualification, can determine whether or not to allow immunity to a researcher. If, he decides, if they decide not to apply immunity, then the entire process is destroyed because obviously NIDA would hand it over and the fellow would be arrested. Uh, that process takes a, about a minimum of two years before you can begin doing the research. Once you begin the research, you have to have a 750-pound safe to keep the dangerous substance in, since it is defined as dangerous. And you, you have to make sure you don't divert the supply in any way for any other purposes. And therefore, there are very incredible forms that are used. While I was at UCLA, uh, as a research subject, I was each joint of marijuana was supplied to me in a manila envelope. Each manila envelope was stamped with the date it had arrived. You, you tore open the envelope. Well, you didn't tear it open because it seemed too anxious. You gently opened the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You gently opened the envelope. Uh, 
record the serial number that also came with it, record the date it had been processed, record your pulse at the time, <laughs> smoke the joint. Now, you didn't just throw the roach away. You put the roach back into the manila envelope, <laughs> made sure it was out, sealed the, the manila envelope. They took it back into the UCLA uh, pharmacy department, put it in the safe, and then at a certain time they would attach it to a government courier and send it back to uh, University of North Carolina where it would be assayed so they could make certain that that serial number had been smoked. <laughs> and to make sure that the contraband substance had not been replaced by a less noxious weed. And that kind of complexity seems absurd. It is absurd. Uh, a lot of researchers have gotten halfway through the process of applying and said, well, I think I'll spend my time on something else. Uh, I, I'm a researcher, I'm not a, a paperwork artist. Um, other researchers have begun only to find that DEA cannot suddenly supply the marijuana. And so they'll find themselves in the middle of a research program and the marijuana will be cut off, effectively destroying any results from that segment of the program. These are all problems which continue to exist. Now my own situation uh, is that I have glaucoma. In 1967, the symptoms of that disease became obvious. The symptoms are simply rings around lights, very pretty, tricolored, uh, dangerous. Uh, it was diagnosed uh, by an optometrist who unfortunately knows how to make glasses but little else as eye strain. In 1968, I began smoking marijuana simply because I was in college uh, <laughs> and recreationally enjoyed it a great deal. Um, <laughs> In 1972, I'd moved to Washington and was reading a book one day and closed one eye and realized I couldn't see the book with the other eye, indicating that there might be some kind of ocular problem. I, uh, <laughs> I got myself to a doctor of optical problems, an ophthalmologist instead of an optometrist, and he said that I had open angle glaucoma. It was quite advanced and placed me on uh, conventional medications for glaucoma. About uh, a year later, I was having rings again. and. Uh, smoked a joint and the rings went away and immediately said, oh, well, this means a lot. Uh, <laughs> and it was a very odd impression. I mean, everything became very clear very quickly, uh, so quickly that I couldn't think it all through properly and so forgot it. Uh, <laughs> except the next morning I remembered that something had happened and so for about the next four months I I did what was uh, probably an illegal research program. Uh, and finally, I reached my conclusions and began using it as a self-medication. The great problem when you're dealing with uh, a medication that's contraband, that's not available, is that it's, it's not always available, that the quality is not controlled. And so you do an odd thing like you start growing your own medicine uh, <laughs> to make up for those uh, terrible periods where there are breaks in supply. And then you do a terribly silly thing. You go to see the Indiana State Fair and leave your house for a number of days. Uh, while I was gone, I live on a second and third story. And the marijuana plants were on the second story. It was a dead end alley. There was a large fence. No problem. A lot of plants. My neighbors put 10 marijuana plants out on their fire escape in full view of the alley. <coughs> the police noticed their marijuana plants, climbed up onto the fire escape, noticed my marijuana plants. The people noticed the police removed their marijuana plants and I was arrested. Uh, <laughs> I came home from the vacation to uh, find an, a search warrant on my uh, kitchen table, real down. Uh, <laughs> got myself some lawyers, explained to them that I was using the marijuana medically. They didn't laugh, but they said prove it, and I, which was my first shattering experience. I thought the lawyer would prove it, and, but no. Uh, but the next interesting experience, I mean, I'd known this since 1973. This is a, a decision which potentially affects at the minimum of two million and probably six to eight million people. Uh, the law had effectively prevented me from going and announcing from every rooftop that I had made a great discovery. The odd thing was two weeks after I was arrested, I found out that UCLA had done research in 1970, had codified the effect, had in a clinical research program as opposed to a therapeutic research program uh, detailed the evidence to the effect that uh, reports like the Marijuana and Health Report to Congress, which is published by DEA, 
about 140 pages long on page 120 in a very small paragraph, mentioned that glaucoma responded well to marijuana and that was its greatest potential therapeutic benefit. Uh, I mention all of that because it's upsetting to know that after six years, uh, evidence of a significant therapeutic value that relates to six million people not only wouldn't be pursued by an individual who found it who had no medical expertise, but would not be pursued by a government who was informed by medical experts. In other words, there was nothing done aggressively. Um, and uh, that disturbed me. I got very mad about being arrested and decided to fight it instead of taking a, a probably a hundred dollar fine. And it seemed interesting. Um, UCLA accepted me as a research subject. I was there for 10 days. Um, they ended up saying, well, everything that you think was right was right, and uh, here are the numbers you need to codify it. That placed uh, a strain on a number of people, particularly the bureaucracies who had allowed UCLA to do the research. They never expected that someone would enter the system this way. Uh, one of the things that was critically important at UCLA is I found out that there were dose values to marijuana that the government had codified at least three dose levels, 1%, 2%, 4%, that the effect on glaucoma was very much dose related. And so suddenly, instead of just thinking about criminal court and uh, getting out of a crime, I began to think about obvious future things like access to a controlled substance that has quality control behind it, making that access legal. And so what I did was I petitioned the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration. The Drug Enforcement Administration got very worried, uh, particularly when it was pointed out to them that the evidence also appeared on written paper that had government seals. Um, they immediately thought the best idea was to refer it to another bureaucracy, so they chose Food and Drug. Food and Drug picked it up and decided that it was best that they refer it to NIDA, and NIDA decided that they couldn't refer it anywhere else because they were the end of the line. <laughs> so. NIDA decided that the most efficient way of getting me marijuana would be to uh, set up a research program. It also turns out that that's the most politically advantageous way for NIDA to handle it because it doesn't begin to threaten the code which says marijuana has no known value. See, if you're still researching it, you don't know it yet. Very convenient. Um, NIDA finally got it together. Uh, the most difficult part of getting it together was to find a doctor because no doctor wanted to become involved in a drug that was very highly politi uh, politicalized. Uh, it went back through the, to the bureaucracies in the opposite way it came out. And finally, for any number of reasons, the news was leaked uh, about a clinical research program. I, in the leak, there was an unfortunate mistake. Certain things were included and the story began to expand until it hit its proper proportions, which was a person would be allowed to use marijuana on an outpatient basis. Using marijuana on an outpatient basis created innumerable problems. The initial thing that was, was desired was for me to go to my doctor six times a day in the hospital to smoke it. I indicated that would seem difficult. <laughs> the second thing that was decided was that it would be wise to give it to me but not tell anyone, that we would keep it a secret. And the reasons that we would keep it a secret would be because someone would break into my house, uh, rob me of my marijuana, and go out and commit uh, terrible crimes against humanity. I tried to point out that the police were the only individuals who had ever broken into my house. And <laughs> And they thought that was a good idea and uh, that we wouldn't bother keeping it a secret. Uh, and it became particularly hard to keep it a secret after the leak went badly for them. Uh, that's the basic conclusion to the bureaucratic process. The bureaucratic process concludes saying, Randall is a research subject in a research program, and that's why he gets his marijuana. And we don't know nothing beyond that. And, uh, and it's a therapeutic program and it's the first program, but we're not going to go crazy with it and do too much of this research. Uh, it has all the semblance of a privilege, you know, benign bureaucracies acting to supply a poor, helpless citizen with his need. Uh, and indeed, that's how the bureaucracies spoke of it. They spoke of their decision as speedy when after six years they'd done nothing, after I began complaining in May 
and issued petition were not able to respond when I could prove I had a condition that was progressive uh, for six months. The six months difference had nothing to do with medical viability. It had a great deal to do with each agency wishing to protect itself politically. It had a great deal to do with the fact that the medical community has been so corrupted by the law that it's no longer interested in the drug, no matter how therapeutic its value may be. And in terms of compassion, it lacks some things, too. Uh, there's an interesting quote from Stalin about death. One death is a tragedy. Uh, a million deaths is a statistic. I'm being employed now is the one exception. Uh, I am the tragedy. Uh, the six million other people in this country have glaucoma are merely statistics. Unless those statistics do something, the government will not respond very favorably or speedily or effectively, uh, especially as long as uh, they don't think it's politically advisable to do so because people are too misinformed to understand. Uh, you have to point out that the reason people are misinformed is these agencies have diligently spent 40 years doing so. Uh, the court decision worked rather better. The court heard the evidence. Uh, on, you know, on my side, I had a doctor who was a nine-year full professor at UCLA, a doctor in Washington, D.C., who was my personal physician, who uh, had been in practice for 20 years and was one of the foremost pathologists in the United States. Uh, on the government side, there was a uh, narcotics agent who had two weeks of training at the Drug Enforcement Administration's school. He wanted to be qualified as an expert witness on the physiologic, psychologic effects of marijuana on the cultivation and harvesting of marijuana. Turned out he had never har harvested or cultivated any marijuana, and so he thereby was not an expert. And when asked for his qualifications of expertise in psychology and uh, physiology, he noted that he also read High Times magazine. And, uh, <laughs> and mentioned that he had just completed a most scholarly work named Weed. Uh, our lawyer asked him if that was a novel, and he said, no, sir, it had pictures. <laughs> it turned out that from his expert evidence, the this, this state was unable to prove that the four or five foot high marijuana plants, which appeared in the courtroom with us all, sitting on the banister so that they towered 10 feet into the air, uh, they could not prove that those plants could produce one joint. And an, another expert was called in from the Drug Enforcement Administration, and, and he validated the fact that, yes, those plants did constitute enough to at least make one joint. <laughs> <laughs> the judge at that time was very happy. He was very thankful that I had not wasted a great deal of effort and said so. He said it would be a shame if someone spent that long growing that large a plant and didn't get anything out of it. Uh, as to medical evidence, the government offered nothing. Every once in a while, the prosecutor would, would come out with a, a brilliant argument, like, Your Honor, we cannot allow him to have marijuana. His legs may fall off. <laughs> but he, ne he never bothered to find a doctor who said that would happen. Uh, and it became fairly much of a circus. Uh, the greatest problem he had probably in examining the witnesses who were on my side were that they were all very honest people uh, and that they all had very high credibility. <coughs> Uh, the court finally decided, after the bureaucracies had decided to give me the marijuana and they made their first delivery on November 12th, a memorable day, uh, <laughs> they, uh, th the court decided on Thanksgiving Eve, a nice day for a decision, that uh, there did exist a medical necessity, totally contradicting all the facets of law. It's saying that the law was basically not well written. And uh, a couple of curious things occurred. The lawyers were a little upset that it wasn't a constitutional decision. That's understandable. Constitutional decisions apply to far more people. They're not so specifically drawn as the decision finally turned out to be. The nice thing about the common law decision is that it appears that historically the marijuana will be forgotten, but the necessity will be remembered. Uh, necessity has only been used 12 times since the 13th century. Uh, effectively. And it basically comes from Magna Carta, and it bas basically says, uh, the peasant knows a lot better than the king what's happening here. Uh, the court basically ruled that those qualifications placed around marijuana are too broadly drawn, that they cannot apply to me because they infringe on what is a biological right. Uh, so while the bureaucracies will tend, <laughs> tend 
or will promote their involvement as a privilege bestowed, it is actually a right that I can fulfill either with or without bureaucratic sanction and would so do. That's it. Uh, and there are a lot of other odd things, but another time. What kind of questions do you have? Yeah. I can consume, that's a very good point because a lot of the press accounts have said free to use it in his own home, uh, which is a bargain at any price even there. But uh, no, I can use it whenever it becomes medically necessary to use. Uh, it's medically necessary to use about once every three or four hours. <laughs> I should point out that UCLA did a number of different kinds of experiments and there seemed to be an almost desperate hope that tetrahydrocannabinol, when refined into a synthetic and ingested as a pill, a nice, unnoxious pill, would work, and it didn't. It only works at this time as an inhaled ingredient. So, yeah. Okay, I'm supposed to have some kind of card. Uh, the delivery was made on November 12th, and everything was a little frantic uh, surrounding it. It had been six. It took six weeks between the time that the leak occurred about this program has been created to get the marijuana actually to me, and that's because it was coming out of the same storehouse that the swine flu was coming out of. <laughs> <laughs> but that may that may be superpower rivalry. I don't know. Uh, Anyway, there are a hundred different varieties. The marijuana is transshipped to North Carolina in huge casts that are about four feet high and equally large around. Uh, it's dried in the sun. <laughs> it, there's, there's very little tender loving care, but otherwise they're, they're very proficient. It's dried in the sun, then it's flaked, then it's roasted. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's no seeds, no stems. <laughs> None of that stuff. Then they decide whether they want to synthesize it down into uh, one of its various THC elements or just to roll it. If they decide to roll it, they go over to one of the tobacco companies, borrow a machine, and within a couple of minutes, they have quite a few. Uh, <laughs> I think they're 100 millimeter. I'm not sure. The only concessions to consumerism are a uh, small red line, which apparently tells people who have never smoked which end to put in their mouth. And even f more faintly, there's an M on each one. Uh, probably, yes, well, I don't know. Probably because in the uh, research environment, they also use placebo joints, uh, where the THC has been totally leached out of them. The quality, uh, as I mentioned before, there, there are at least three qualities. It's called 1% N, 2% N, 3% N, very vague. Uh, the way they figure out the quality for the joint is they know the amount of vegetable matter you know, marijuana leaf in each joint. It's 0.9 tenths of a gram. Well, it seems redundant. It's 0.9 grams. Uh, and then each, each joint has a quality of THC, which is assayed. Uh, the pack I have here says 2.04 delta 9 THC, which is substantial. Uh, the, joints, <laughs> the joints are actually more substantial. Apparently, they, they didn't. <laughs> Uh, my initial deliveries were vintage marijuana. I mean, they came from 1970, 71, 72. They've been stored in cold storage. You know, apparently, if you don't aggressively pursue research, the marijuana builds up on you and you have to keep it around. Uh, the latest stuff I'm getting is apparently from the most recent harvest. It tastes much better. Uh, and it's 2.0, it's 2.5, which is a substantial increase in the dose. I think normal street marijuana sells for around, uh, not sells, uh, has about uh, 1.6 THC. Huh? What kind of normal street marijuana? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Iowa domestic, I don't know. Uh, you know, a good Colombian would run more. And if you can afford good Colombian, and you could probably easily exceed the level that's supplied here. 
Uh, the marijuana that I'm using, I've had two stories on it, and since I'm dealing with three bu bureaucracies, that's a reduction in one over what I usually get. Uh, the marijuana is either a combination of two, Mexican and Afghani, or it's, yeah, it's, or it's a combination of 20, which sounds nicer, but maybe it's only two. It's very strange to look at because in the flaking, lots is destroyed. Uh, as much as is known now, I can only call it an arrest. Uh, glaucoma is a condition without known cure. It's a nerve head disease. There's no way to bring the nerve back. Uh, and so all attempts are t simply to arrest the progression of the illness. Uh, and so that's all I'd say marijuana does. It certainly isn't a cure. I mean, you don't smoke it and suddenly see the whole world again. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I smoked on the way here. <laughs> if I really wanted to be high, I could, I could try real hard. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the problem, uh, well, I don't, it's not a problem. The high that you get from marijuana is almost totally psychologic. And uh, there was an Army study done in 1974, which wasn't released until 1975 because the results were very favorable, and only then under a Freedom of Information Act. And the results basically showed that the high was something that was not physiologic. In other words, uh, they were dealing with very chronic users, people who'd <coughs> smoked for six or seven years at high levels, and uh, found that those people had totally adapted to the high. Uh, it, it didn't almost exist. And when you begin to transfer your definitions, if you use it recreational, you define the period you use it in as a recreation. Uh, when you're recreating, <laughs> You don't have to think a great deal in very specific ways, and so you recreate. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but when, you start, when you start defining it as a medicine, it, a lot of the thrill goes out of it. You know, when you go, oh, well, you know, it's time to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Th that's especially true very early in the morning. Oh, well, I don't know about this. But, you know, late at night, being very relaxed, listening to the stereo, knowing that the police are not going to come in, you know, I can sometimes force myself to get high. That's probably, well, because jazz was a type of music which, while natively American, is certainly not within an Anglo-Saxon European tradition. And when jazz did come in, it was viewed very much, like the waltz in the, in the 19th century was viewed as a very scandalous development that anyone would move to three, four time. And, and jazz was much worse. It was syncopated. <laughs> and, you know, you didn't just have one melody line. And, People improvised. They didn't write down their notes. Uh, it was a very odd thing to begin to occur, especially in a country which was still predominantly rural instead of urban. Uh, you know, and this became uh, more and more concern when you begin. You're dealing with well a whole time, which is hard to remember, but uh, many religions that were very fundamentalist at that time. Did not even allow dancing, and jazz was very scandalous, particularly when it was. Electron, you know, made electronic, and suddenly radio began extending it, not only in places like New Orleans and Chicago, but all over. <laughs> we should get stoned and listen to some music. No. <laughs> no, no. Okay, well, if you don't want to, don't want to say that jazz was the reason, and then you can just simply say that, that blacks were a convenient group because they did use marijuana, and marijuana... Marijuana became much like the excuse you use for a gangster that you can't pin down in any other way. You get him on a tax charge. You get somebody who's out there protesting policy, possibly forming opposition to what is the status quo or what is the accepted policy of government. And he may use marijuana. If he uses marijuana, that's a convenient way to disrupt his abilities 
to gain cohesion, to gain a group, to be part of a movement. Yes. No, until exactly. I when Mexico, you know, we well, are entering. Oh well. Okay. <laughs> Can't help you anymore. Oh, thank you. A problem, a problem solved. <laughs> okay, what? Yeah. Well, I, th I think no one's in good shape until, uh, for instance, what Carter could do would he, he could force a DEA, which since 1972 normal has been requesting to reschedule marijuana, <coughs> so it could be used medically at least. I mean, DEA has effectively blocked normal because normal is approaching it in abstractions. Normal isn't going blind. Uh, and, you know, unless you're going blind, they won't listen to you. Uh, but if, if Carter could do anything, uh, bureaucratically, what he could do is he could force DEA to give the issue to FDA, which is then allowed to decide if marijuana has medical value. Uh, the obvious thing that would be better than that would be to go to Congress and ask them to reevaluate the law in terms of facts, because you let the bureaucracies get a hold of this and they go mad, uh, literally, uh, because each one has to be concerned about its budget and uh, neither none of them are, are overly logical and none of them are very brave. In other words, they have a lot of data that they're just not willing to provide people or a lot of data that they're not willing to go to Congress and, and say, look, we found it's harmless. They don't want to say that. Uh, and if it's going to be referred to Congress, then the only thing that will help is for each congressman to be convinced that there are people who are interested in the issue and interested in such a way as if it will affect his political future. I mean, that seems I tried really to believe that people would proceed rationally. Uh, they did proceed fairly rationally with me because I had all the evidence and for them to proceed irrationally with me would have created too much publicity. But that doesn't mean that, that politicians are going to necessarily proceed rationally uh, unless they're convinced. Uh, and it doesn't mean just convincing them of the facts. I mean, you can talk to a politician and you'll say, well, I understand it's harmless and I understand this is a foolish policy. But, you know, the people in my state are misinformed. <laughs> in some way, he's got to be made certain that there are enough people in his area that want marijuana either decriminalized or legalized that it will affect his political future. Otherwise, he doesn't care. He doesn't care that people go to jail because, uh, you know, he does have to get reelected. And uh, it's a very tough situation. No, it's free. <laughs> and uh, the uh, doses have been running from five to eight a day. Five to eight reefers a day? Yeah. <laughs> Any? Um, can anybody try to track down that together? No. That's what I was talking about before, that since I've been made, well, you could. What you would have to do at this time would be to go through a 15-month procedure like I did. Uh, if you succeeded in getting yourself arrested uh, through a, an act of foolishness on your part, uh, <laughs> or that you could probably begin a civil action, but they would be incredibly long. Uh, uh, the delays that you can 
confront are extraordinary. The research program only lasts for 50 individuals. You know, and if you go by the, what the bureaucracies have provided me, they can say it's a privilege. The court case makes it a right, but each person has to demonstrate the right him or herself. Now with glaucoma, if the person isn't too blind, that's okay because they can afford to progressively lose a bit of sight while the government is stalling or, or trying to figure out a way. If you have cancer and you're going into chemotherapy, it already means your condition is very highly progressed, that you'll probably uh, be dead within a year, a year and a half, or two years, especially if you're on intensive chemotherapy. Uh, if marijuana has many medical uses. One of its primary uses, it appears, is that when a person goes through chemotherapy, the theory of chemotherapy is, is very blunt. It's not a very refined tool. The theory is that the body mass exceeds the cancerous mass, so you start killing it. And you figure that you'll kill the cancer before you kill off the patient. Uh, the drugs are non-selective as to cancerous or non-cancerous cells. And uh, because they are so toxic, so poisonous, the drugs, uh, it causes severe nausea, people can't eat, and they become very depressed. They also have a weight loss that's tremendous, sometimes 50 percent of their body weight, uh, which isn't the best way to recover from a disease like cancer, to lose body weight and become very weak. Uh, in India, 3,000 years ago, marijuana was used to prevent nausea. They have just discovered that marijuana prevents nausea in cancer chemotherapy patients. Uh, and this is uh, something that they're, again, not pursuing very effectively or forcefully. Uh, and I, you know, if what the, chemo what the marijuana does is it stops the nausea, but it also has a, ends up having people beginning to eat things like hot fudge sundaes and pretzels. <laughs> True. <laughs> in one program, a Baptist minister decided that uh, one of the problems with being a research subject is, especially if you're an in-hospital research subject, is that you can be exposed one day to marijuana and not throw up and eat hot fudge sundaes and have a great time, and the next day to make sure that the marijuana was working, you know, uh, they give you a placebo, which means that whole day is spent throwing up and not wanting to eat and feeling very miserable. Uh, a number of people have left projects for that reason. They just go, I can get it on my own outside a lot easier than this. And uh, no, they just leave. But a person with chemotherapy would never live through the process as it's now designed. And uh, I think that's a fairly good indictment of the way it's now designed. Yeah. Well, I, I would probably say, you know, that, that terrible cliche, write your congressman and senator. I found out that congressmen and senators really do read their mail. And, uh, and that even if they don't read each letter, what they do is they put the letters on their desk and they go, this many people are for it, this many people are against it, a bigger pile is for it. <laughs> I think I'll vote for it. Uh, it becomes basically that simple. And if they know that pressure is there, they'll respond. Uh, not only would I write local congressmen and the two senators from this state at the national level, because I have a good feeling that there are going to be a number of bills introduced to decriminalize this year. I have some hopes that when I get back to Washington, I can get in contact with people now that we have a government again. And, uh, <laughs> and see if something can be done to include a discussion of the medical need. In addition to the senators and congressmen, I would also recommend writing the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare Secretary and the Attorney General, since both of those people control the sub-agencies that are doing <laughs> that are the present structure. Uh, and if the Cabinet really does do anything in the next administration, that's probably the best way of getting uh, some interest on the part of Carter. The most interesting thing, of course, was the thing that came out the other day. Uh, that Carter's son had been found smoking marijuana and as a result was discharged from the Navy. Uh, and it indicates that, uh, well, not only indicates that the President's son smokes marijuana, smoked marijuana, he doesn't smoke anymore, uh, but uh, it also indicates that his son's life has been deeply affected by that smoking and by the law, which would probably reinforce his, his attitude toward decriminalization. Yeah. I'm sorry. If it's legalized, do you think it should be a three-day dosage? I mean, the 
I might. That might be a problem, yeah. I could live with it. <laughs> because, it, well, you could, uh, any number of arguments develop around that. The current price is inflated because of government policies which are specifically designed to inflate that price. And uh, if the government remained the only out, outlet facility for controlled, regulated marijuana, in other words, medical marijuana, uh, then you could begin antitrust action <laughs> because they have a monopoly. Uh, and force the price down to what it would be in a competitive market, a nickel for a ton. <laughs> no. Uh, I imagine I could be arrested for uh, some strange research statute that he gave it away. Uh, and the other person would be in incredible trouble. I mean, I could at least go back to, well, I really needed it, Your Honor. The other person would end up to, well, I just really liked it. <laughs> and you know, where the judge wouldn't take away my eyesight, they'd take away the other guy's life for seven years or, you know. That's one of the most curious things. Uh, it seems when you get to something like eyesight, where potentially anyone is affected, and uh, it's a very basic human instinct that's involved. You get much more action and recognition than you do if you're just an individual. They can take away your, your life, basically. There's a person in Missouri now who sold less marijuana than I have in this packet who was scheduled to go to jail for seven years. And that was his first offense. Uh, and they're taking away his life for seven years. Uh, someone's got to realize, sooner or later, criminal is such an easy word to use, but someone's got to recognize, sooner or later, criminal is a pretty heavy penalty. Just to call someone a criminal it places them totally outside the community. And, uh, you know, we have to have a new respect for the term and, uh, and figure out if the law is rational on the basis of that term. Ah, the amotivational syndrome. Uh, I have gained a tremendous amount of weight since I began smoking these. Uh, <laughs> there are two studies. One was the Army study. They said people would gain a great deal of weight. Uh, but that was from short-term use. Long-term use tends to cause you to become slightly underweight, actually. Um, as, as for motivation, the famous amotivational syndrome was initially, in, well, it, came from a number of different sources, but it was first sort of officially codified at UCLA. Now I'll tell you something about UCLA. You would go there, you were placed in a mental ward. Uh, the mental ward allowed for six subjects. <laughs> I turned out to be a seventh extra subject flown in from Washington. Everywhere, everyone there was terrified that I was from the DEA. I was terrified that DEA had planted someone there. It was a very scary experience for the first couple of days. Uh, paranoid almost, and I didn't even get marijuana in the first couple of days. Uh, the research subjects have a very uh, constrained life. They're not allowed to leave the premises without being chaperoned. They are constantly watched by more staff members than there are research subjects. The only things you look forward to are eating three meals and playing ping pong. Now, if you do this for 28 or 90 days, you get very skitzy uh, because all the windows have chicken wire on them. Uh, <laughs> you begin to lose contact with the real world. Uh, especially since every day you're confronting a different doctor in a white coat who's uh, asking you how you feel. Uh, they decided that everyone felt amotivational at UCLA, and so the famous amotivational syndrome was codified. About a year later, someone said, why don't we try an experiment? <laughs> and instead of just looking at these people and saying they're amotivational, give them something that they might be motivated toward. It's sort of a neutral environment we have here with these peach-colored walls and and so they started giving them psychology tests, giving them 25 cents per question. People started walking out after 90 days with $3,000. <laughs> and they said, well, maybe we're giving them too much money. And, you know. <laughs> so they reduced it to 10 cents. And uh, the people still kept producing, you know, I mean, you didn't have anything else to do. You answer weird questions like, are you an agent of God? <laughs> <laughs> You get, you get 10 cents for that answer, and how long does it take? I mean, you know, are you in trouble with the law? I had a great deal of trouble with that one. I finally said yes, and it was marked down later as a psychological problem that I had. <laughs> you know, I, 
They finally lowered it to five cents before they quit the experiment. Even on five cents, they were losing too much money. Uh, the amotivational syndrome is a fluke of the imagination. It's what happens when you do something recreationally. Uh, when you're recreating, you don't seem to be motivated to do very much but play. And uh, Einstein doesn't come up much. In Jamaica, uh, culture determines use. Culture determines how it's used, uh, what people think of it, uh, which would indicate how psychological the high is. In Jamaica, it's given to small children as a drug which will motivate them to learn in school and help them retain the information they receive in class, you know, which is totally opposed to our opinion. Yeah? I don't know. Uh, I do know there is some hypnotic research going on. Marijuana is apparently very much an aid to hypnosis. I also know that most of the people who deal with it, marijuana in the medical profession are psychiatrists, uh, probably because psychiatrists feel less inhibited about doing that kind of thing than anybody else. Uh, it's very hard to get experts in particular fields involved, and that's one of the problems. Uh, you end up with a guy who's a psychiatrist, he can't really tell you he really can't be qualified as an expert witness on cancer chemotherapy or on glaucoma. I was very fortunate in that the doctor who was allowed to research the marijuana and its ocular effects was an ophthalmologist. Also an ophthalmologist with an incredible reputation. Uh, if he had been an ophthalmologist without an incredible reputation, he probably, I probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere. How much did it cost you to win this particular victory? I have no idea. I haven't gotten all the bills yet. Uh, I hate ballpark figures because someone might meet it, and, uh, and the, the lawyer bill is still outstanding. It costed $1,000 at least just to get the medical data necessary. You know. The oddest thing you end up with marijuana at the present time, uh, aside from the law itself, is uh, that in, in a real situation, you have 13 million people in this country who smoke marijuana every day and they have, obviously, a wide variety of physical ailments. Doctors for 40 years have not been allowed to know anything about marijuana. And so you end up with a population that may know a great deal more about marijuana's medical benefits than the doctors themselves. And uh, I, I would think it would be beneficial if there was a mechanism. Of course, it would be abused. But uh, a little abuse for a lot of information might be worthwhile, where an individual could say, hey, this marijuana really helps whatever it is he has. <laughs> I know one fellow who wants to do it because it's curbed his aggression. Uh, and, and have people come forward like that, and if they can make what even sounds like a halfway plausible case, at least do the research on that one person and find out if the effect is true. Is there money available for that kind of research? No. There's, there's no bureaucracy that, that is capable of handling it, because each one, NIDA only does drug abuse research, not therapeutic research. FDA doesn't do any research which was a tremendous problem that I had because all FDA does is approve of research programs brought to it by pharm pharmaceutical companies. And one of the problems FDA had in dealing with me was I was just an individual. <laughs> I wasn't a company. And uh, that became very sticky. No company will get involved because it's illegal. They make profits. They don't make drugs. If it becomes legalized, how will it be marketed? How will it be marketed? I don't know. I, mean, I think that's one of the basic questions that There may very well be. There's a liquor model to, to work off of and a cigarette model. There are a number of different models that could be used. Do you smoke regular cigarettes? Yeah. Do you find any kind of similar, similar effect in marijuana smoking and regular cigarette smoking? No. In fact, just the opposite. A lot of the ways that the research is developed, in other words, a lot of the ways that something like glaucoma marijuana is related, is not because the government began with that intention. It's because the government be began with a different intention. The intention when the, the ocular research was being done was to prove or disprove the fact that people's pupils dilated. Now, the reason that was important was because if their pupils dilated, you would have a clue to, his, to whether the person was smoking or not, and then you would know whether to go further and ask for, to, arrest his, you know, to arrest his body. Uh, they found out that it didn't cause the pupils to get larger, but it did cause this reduction in pressure. Uh, 
Some research was done because cigarette smoking creates all sorts of respiratory problems, uh, only to find out that marijuana might be a very good drug to use in asthma because totally unlike cigarettes, which constrict your bronchial tubes, marijuana opens the bronchial tubes. Uh, if you're having an asthma attack, it's a good way of getting over it. <laughs> One more question, and we should, that should be it. Yeah. No, I go once a week to Howard University. Uh, the doctor at Howard University became interested uh, enough to apply for the research program because uh, black males have an eight times as high incidence of glaucoma as white males do. Uh, I go see him once a week or once every five days, uh, depending on how long my supply lasts. Uh, and we discuss the dosage that has been used and whether that's an adequate dose or needs to be increased or decreased. Then he just gives it to me. Yeah. If marijuana is a good alternative to those drugs? I don't think the government's doing any research like that. Obviously, marijuana is a good alternative to alcohol simply because it's not toxic and uh, it doesn't cause a biological high. That's it. <laughs>